Hello. Uh, welcome to my digital presentation about discovering medieval comics. The point of this uh, presentation, this talk, is to one, show off some Macbeth pages that were inspired by medieval illuminated manuscripts, and two, more importantly, draw a connection between past and present, and to show how contemporary comics are in a direct lineage with this quote unquote high art form. So you know me, hello. Um, I'm a comic switch art educator and I'm an illustrator. Like I said, Macbeth is coming out soon, but I'm probably preaching to the choir on that one. And it's currently available for pre-orders from Avery Hill, who are just gems and I love them. And also just please support them because they're great. For this talk, we're gonna do a quick check-in which is what I always do when I teach. We're gonna talk about comics, what are they? We're gonna talk about how comics function, um, visual languages then and now. And we're gonna get into the sticky question of what's the difference between high versus low art? When I present this live, we're gonna, we do a meme making activity, uh, which you could do on your own if you like. And also just say hello to this beautiful uh, medieval oddish here. One of my favorite illustrations. So for our check-in, which medieval owl is your vibe today? Um, I'm going to say eight is definitely my vibe today. Got a lot of stuff on my mind and I got a busy schedule that I'm trying to balance, get everything done. Um, it's a busy month for me. I'm looking forward to next month, which I have some time off. So what owl is your vibe today? And all vibes are welcome, uh, whether you're feeling stressed, busy, or happy as a little six uh, owl. Welcome. So let's start off with the world's worst uh, headline, which we've seen a lot of in the past decade. Pal bam, comics aren't just for kids anymore. Um, never have been and never will be. So what's a comic? Um, I don't know why I find this question so annoying, but hey, it's the same in the same vein as what is art? Um, what does it all mean? Uh, what's a comic? Why are we here today? So I'm just going to go straight to one of the experts, Mr. Eisner, um, and his term sequential art, which he defines as a literary medium that narrates by arrangement of images and texts in an intelligible sequence. So to your left, we have an example of medieval sequential art. This is the story of David. And you read this in order, in sequence, and it tells a story, um, even without text, that you can read and you can understand. To your right is an example of a Macbeth page that includes um, some medieval illuminated manuscripts. What makes a comic? Uh, so it's art in a sequence that tells a story and one of the functions and one of the ways it functions is by using panels and gutters. The panels are the term we use for the art in the comic. The gutters are the spaces in between. Gutters can be teeny tiny little guys. They can be all kinds of things. The important part is the spaces in between the pictures. Gutters show time passing. Now the time could be Nanoseconds, the time could be centuries, any amount of time, but it is time that is passed between images. So our comic, our medieval comic on the left, we are seeing, um, it's a bit blurry, I apologize, but in the top panel, we are seeing people preparing a body for burial, wrapping a body in a funerary shroud to be put into a coffin. There's a gap, there's a space, a gutter, and then we see the next panel, the next image, is a funerary procession, people carrying a coffin draped in cloth to the place where it will be buried. And we, as the reader, can understand that this is the same person in both images, above being prepared for burial, to be put in the coffin, and below coffin being taken to burial. We understand it, that this is the same person. The gutters can also represent uh, things happening simultaneously. So to our right, 
and above we have uh, it's a medieval trope, a medieval uh, uh, image that was done a lot of times called the dance macabre, the dance of death. And basically it's saying that, you know, no matter who you are in life, we're all going to dance with death at the end. We're all the same. In the central image, we have the dance. Everybody dancing around simultaneously is, you know, uh, hell's opening and heaven's opening and all this great stuff. And then simultaneously, we have close-ups of different people from different walks of life who are all dancing with death. And if we were contemporary uh, to this image being made, we might be able to pick out a bit better who they are based on their clothing. But we have everyone from farmers uh, to knights to popes um, to priests and uh, kingly people and even women. Imagine that. So panels and gutters are how comics function, but comics and medieval illuminated manuscripts also function by using shared visual languages. So sometimes these visual languages get lost to us. A good example are the Pictish people who lived in the eastern part of Scotland in ancient times. They have an entire visual language that we can recognize today um, with repeated symbols, but the meaning of those symbols is lost. That would be like, let's say in 2000 years, some archaeologist combs through our ruined world and finds a Superman S and thinks, what does this mean? Whereas we would know not only that it stands for Superman, but just by looking at that symbol, we would understand uh, who he fights for, um, his origin story, his love interest, his villain that he's fighting against, and even something about his character, what kind of a person Superman is. So sometimes uh, these medieval languages have come forward into the present, and sometimes they're completely lost. Um, but a lot of the time you see them represented in saints' images. And like I said, these languages evolve. Some things have been lost, some things have been changed. And also I want to highlight about a time-honored tradition in the visual language of comics, which is making stuff up. Reference material who? I don't know her. But first, saints and symbols. Our brains are hardwired to recognize patterns. It's one way that we survived. And sometimes it gets us into trouble when we get into the conspiracy theory end of human existence. Our brains love patterns. They want to recognize them. It makes us feel safe. So like I said, some of these symbols have carried forward. Modern people today would see this AMAB, AFAB person, a tree, an apple, and know exactly what story is being told. But some of the saints' images we might have lost. So in the center, we have an old man removing a thorn from the paw of a lion who has attained universal consciousness. Um, this, a medieval person would know that this is Saint Jerome. This is from his story. Um, and then the saint on our right is Saint Margaret. Um, that's a dragon, by the way, who's swallowing her. Again, the changing visual languages. We would not maybe recognize this as a dragon, um, but a medieval person would. Anyway, Margaret is being swallowed by this dragon. You can see just the end of her cloak is still poking out of its mouth, but she's bursting forth through the power of her saintliness. And these saints attributes, they're almost like superhero sigils. Uh, sigils, excuse me. Uh, the, the images of the saints might change, but their sigils do not. And it's an important thing for back in the day, public art especially, with a, when we had a population with a low literacy rate, to have these signifiers. Like I said, symbols change. For example, a medieval person would have known Satan, the devil, to be blue, and to have chicken's feet instead of hairy goat legs and being red, like we think of him today, and also would have known Satan to have wings because he's an angel. Also, shout out to the crotch demon. It's one of my favorite depictions. And back to the time-honored tradition, 
of making stuff up in sequential art, in comics, in medieval illuminated manuscripts. Because why not? Um, this medium, sequential art, has always been an escape from reality. Because gritty realism is there, it's right outside your door. Um, we don't necessarily need it in our comics. And furthermore, Western art's fixation on realism and accurate representation is a relatively new thing in our story of art. Um, we were much more interested in making things look cool um, in stylization. Because honestly, you know, that artist who drew that lion may have never ever seen a lion before. Um, but we can still understand something that's trying to be conveyed. We might understand the lion still as a symbol of royalty, of courage, of ferocity. And the artist would never have needed to see a lion or represent a lion anatomically accurately to get that message across. In comics and sequential art, has always been about the fantastic, the sublime, the super, um, things that cannot be expressed any other way. Um, so I have to the left Hild something by Hildegard von Bingen, a bit more on her later. This is her depiction of the Queen of Heaven, um, the Golden Queen of Heaven. Um, so she is constantly, in her sequential art, depicting the divine, the beyond, and the abstract. Um, next to her is a page from Macbeth where a witch is delivering a prophecy to Macbeth. Next over, we have a depiction of the Holy Lamb of God, um, which is something that's described in words in the Bible, um, but this sequential artist is trying to show or get across um, that description of what it's like to be in the presence of this Holy Lamb. And then to the right, again, is a page from Macbeth where I was trying to get across uh, Lady Macbeth descending into her psychosis uh, of her guilt for killing Duncan. So now let's talk about one of my favorite or biggest bones of contention, high versus slow art. Um, it's something that I ran into when I was doing my master's and decided to do comics. Um, I came in as a painter, a quote unquote fine artist. Um, and my professors really didn't like it. Um, they accused me of just wanting to make money, <laughs> which is laughable knowing the state of the comics economy. Um, so it really got me thinking like, why, what is the distinction between high versus low art? What does it really mean? Um, so here's what I've come up with. It's high art if it's expensive. It's high art if it's exclusive. It's low art if it's affordable and if anyone can enjoy it. And moreover, this is about a power dynamic. Something is high art if the art has more power over you. For example, if you wanted to go see a Picasso at a museum, You'd have to put on pants and shoes and go to that museum during its specified opening hours and go into the gallery and stand in front of this Picasso. Maybe you wouldn't even get to sit down. And how long could you spend with this work of art? You obviously can't touch it. No way. Um, you are going to it. That Picasso has power over you and your actions. And maybe it's not even accessible to everyone who can't afford to go to that specific gallery. In America, we charge people to get into our galleries. Um, whereas comics, the power dynamic is reversed. So with a printed comic, you have power over the art. You read this comic wherever you would like, in the bath, on the bus to go see the Picasso, uh, in the woods. And if the comic happens to fall into your bathwater or into the mud, it's not that big a deal. I mean, you might be bummed, but it's not the end of that art. It is not ruined. And you can rip up your comic. You can give it to somebody else. You have power over it because it's affordable, because it's printed, 
and you have easy access to it on your own terms. Now, some of some things, you know, we want to keep our Picassos behind glass and we want to keep our medieval manuscripts behind glass because they are one of a kind. Um, and also they're made with really expensive materials. So manuscripts are made on calf skin. It's not paper. Parchment is carefully prepared, uh, basically leather. They're also made with real gold. And some of the pigments are crushed semi-precious stones. So here's an example of technology equaling accessibility. By the technology, I mean printing and I mean paper. Paper is a technological advancement that came to Europe uh, through the Islamic part of the Iberian Peninsula, thanks to the Chinese. So thanks Kailun, the uh, inventor of paper. And also thanks Gutenberg for inventing the movable type press. Now, East Asia was printing long before uh, the West ever was, but you know, we'll give a shout out to Gutenberg in any case um, for his movable type technology. Um, also, just like a fun fact. Um, so Bible was the first thing that was printed in the West. Um, right on its heels came all the how to hunt witches manuals. So cool. Let's talk a little bit about the artists who create this sequential art then and now. Back in the day, they are anonymous. We don't know who they are, with a few exceptions. How they're working in a monastery, so even though they're anonymous, they get housing for free. They get food and they get community. And honestly, in this economy, that sounds amazing. The exception that I wanna highlight is Hildegard von Bingen. If you aren't familiar with her work, I would highly, 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 highly recommend you check her out. She's one of my favorite artists, period. Um, she was an abbess, so she ran uh, an abbey of nuns and did things her way, which was pretty boss. Um, she's a music composer, she's an artist, a writer, an herbalist, and a visionary. This is a self-portrait in the middle um, where she is receiving divine inspiration for her theological writing. And the poor monk is just peeping his head in, can I get you anything, do you need a cup of tea? Um, fantastic. Contemporary comic artists like myself, we are the opposite of anonymous. We are our brand. I'm. But I'm having to sell myself, um, my individual self, my, you know, this is what makes me unique. And this is why you should buy into me. Um, this is why you should buy my comics. Um, and I'm working for page rates uh, for an advance on future royalties. Um, or I'm not, I'm just trying to sell my comics. And my art making equals money in theory. It doesn't always work that way. And a lot of our artists are beloved but broke um they people who have created some of our most iconic and beloved characters have died penniless because of the system that we're currently working in so it's kind of a toss-up the audience knows who you are but you can't pay your medical bills whereas kind of working in anonymity but you get free beer Anyway, in conclusion, the main thing that I wanted to take, wanted you to take away from this is that there is a direct lineage from medieval sequential art to modern comics. Comics are not new. Comics are not, not, for, not just for kids anymore. Comics have been an established part of the Western art canon for centuries. They predate mass media. They predate the Industrial Revolution. And they even predate the Renaissance. Uh, they've always been an important creative endeavor for humanity. But making art more accessible to more people is the fastest way for people to claim that it's not real, um, that it's just in it for the money, or not to be taken seriously. So the next time you run across somebody who thinks that comics aren't real art, um, Maybe that's a question to ask. Is it not real art because a lot of people can enjoy it? And my last point is, I hope that contemporary comic creators can get their needs met, their material needs met as they make their artwork. I hope that 
as a society, we can move towards valuing creatives for the contributions that they make to our culture, our society, our lives, um, and not just expect them to be branding themselves as individuals um, in order to pay the rent. But thank you very much for listening and for paying attention. And I hope that this was informative. And yeah, thanks so much for 